sometimes, Richard, when you uh, when you look at the race cards, you must see a name and think, oh, great. <laughs> How much we pre-prepare everything, I think, is, you know, pre-prepared, the, the pre-prepared whole lines, to my mind at least, just don't work. It's trying to force a round peg into a square hole. Everything happens live. Um, but there's no doubt that some horses' names, some race days as well, you know, the, big, the biggest danger to making mistakes tends to be when you switch off. It tends not to be the high profile races. It tends to be those six or seven races where you haven't learned them properly, you haven't done the discipline. You really think it's gonna be easy and your brain doesn't have all of those safeguards or you know um, normal processes you go through to stop you cocking up. So um, on smaller days, quite often, we'll have some fun either with the scanner, particular word to get into a commentary, I don't know, um, an association with a name. And sometimes you see names um, and yeah, there'll, there'll be something you can immediately associate with a particular name, whether it be a band, for example, you try and, we did an Abba night, they were, it was an Abba tribute band playing up after racing at Epsom, it was a five runner race and what have you, it was a mile and a half. I think we managed to get 11 Abba titles into the commentary, hopefully without it really sounding absolutely ridiculous, because that, obviously that's going a step too far. But it's nice on a family day in particular, I think, if you can just not take yourself too seriously and some horses' names really lend themselves open to others. There are, of course, lots of other horses' names, however, just before we move off horses' names, that fill you with absolute dread. Um, the most famous of which, you know, were, were the likes of the Spoonerism, like Mary Hinge, one of the two ugly sisters in the spoof Cinderella. Fortunately, the intended half-sister, Betty Swallocks, got refused the following year from the same owner, thank you. Um, People who name horses to try and trip up commentators. They're lovely horses. Why on earth would you name your horse? Well, bitch for one. Hellcat, mud wrestler, both from the same owner. Um, Gorn, my son, which I think might have been Oliver Reed's horse, actually, which might have been funny the first time, but when you've got to keep saying it, it gets a bit um, monotonous. I remember being scared stiff when I had to call Winker Watson in one of my first Royal Ascot commentaries. If that had gone pear-shaped in front of Her Majesty, that wouldn't have gone too well. But the one that used to fill me with dread, and it was Ducky Fuzz horse of Martin Featherston Godley's that used to run. It was a seven furlong handicap. I seem to come across it every single time because if you haven't played that particular drinking game, which I had when I'd grown up the cricket, it, not only would you like to get it wrong, but in trying to correct it, it would just make it worse. And you know, the lesson to people is if you don't want, if you want commentators to pronounce your horse a lot, don't call it ridiculously silly names. So we don't make up things in advance, doesn't work and fit. Sometimes you're not really sure where you're going with certain things and you're actually just pleased to get something out that sounds plausible. Um, sometimes you can think of things a long way from home, um, which you can then deliver quite well, hopefully. The intention is just to support what is out on the track. The race sources are the stars. You're just trying to find words that complement them. I think the one that probably was the scariest was Frankel's champion stakes win at the end of his career at Ascot when everyone was practicing all sorts of lines for the horse that wins 10 lengths all of the time. And if you remember, he fell out the stalls and that always gave the possibility that A, he wasn't gonna win and B, he wasn't gonna win by very far and that means you haven't got much time. And all I remember was that I wanted to have something about the ground, because if you remember the build up to Frankel's win had been all about soft ground and this sort of thing. And I started saying something and I just hadn't a clue what the end of it was really going to be. And it sort of came out as, um, something along the lines of all grounds, all comers, all beaten, something like that. Um, and it sort of just about made sense, so I was pretty comfortable that I hadn't cocked it up, and at least I hadn't gone down the unbeaten in 14 or whatever it was route. But the reason that it turned out to be particularly proud from my point of view was just that at the late Henry Cecil's Thanksgiving um, service, uh, for his life they printed off the order of service, and there were four individual quotes scattered through, one of which um, was that quote from the end of that commentary because it had chimed a chord with Sir Henry and the family and what have you and the thought from a lad who grown up watching all of his horses run and what have you that in some shape or form you'd actually been able to provide a line that was thought good enough um, as part of the celebration of life possibly the greatest trainer is still probably one of my proudest moments even though I know the line <laughs> was a complete car crash at the time thankfully it came out more or less right and conveyed obviously something something of the day Thing with big races is just not to overanalyze them, not get too hung up with things, um, just let it happen, just try and relax, try and enjoy it. The commentary I enjoyed most was really came off the back of when our youngest had been 
I'm sorry, our eldest had just been born. I had five months of no sleep. And every new parent knows exactly what the hell that's like. You turn out the race course, he's fuggy and just trying to get through the day. It was Porto Star and Denman's Gold Cup, I think. Um, when you look back on it, it wasn't a particularly interesting race, really. Denman just ran the finish out of all of them one by one. But I've never, never felt such a response from a crowd before. They just sort of followed every twist and turn. And going out on the final circuit, I think, when Denman just began to assert and Porto Star made a slight mistake. I can't remember again exactly what I said, but it's something along the lines of Denman's got him at it. And the response from the crowd was like thinking, whoa, you know, it's a long way out here. And you realise then that you could actually not play the crowd, but everyone's got that anticipation and everything. And, and that for me was actually one of the clearest. I can still remember every thought through that final minute and a half thinking, right, don't, you know, if you go too early, everyone's just going to go berserk. No one will hear things. Everyone's shouting and screaming. So just keep drip feeding it in. Just keep trying to, you know, just next chapter. Is he making more ground? Is he, you know, how much is... And, the, you know, and it just unfolded all the way down the hill. Um, as I say, it wasn't a particularly exciting race. And then all the way down the hill, when you realise Denman's going to win, you're just trying to think, right, what, what sums this up? What, what are you seeing? What, what are the attributes that Denman's brought to the race? And, uh, you know, I'm thinking, right, he's, he's like a fight. He's, he's kept going. He's just kept pummeling and pummeling. So, again, okay, pummeling's a bit, but, but relentless is good. And the scene is relentless. You think, right, okay, remorseless, that's quite good as well. So they're together. And the pounding bit, Quarter star on the ropes covering up, you're thinking, okay, pounding, submission, that's a, you know, and all of those, I can remember all of those words being pieced together, knowing that you'd likely to have enough time to deliver them, and then it's just don't cock it up. I sort of, the answer is Denman at the end is a bit odd, because never say you what the hell the question is, but fortunately everyone else seems to remember what the question was. And it's not that the commentary was particularly good, it was just the anticipation, I think, of everyone there that day, and that performance. And I think I've never felt as in tune with the crowd before, and probably will never since, particularly now, a lot of it's on TV. But that day, I can still absolutely remember. Everyone seemed twice as buzzed up as I was. I was just calmly moving them around, maybe because I hadn't had the same build-up because I'd had no sleep and the kids were, you know. Jack was still very young and focus was possibly less on racing than normal, but that was probably my most enjoyable two minutes of commentary just because it was so clear. I can still recall it so much. Um, I think the worst moments, whenever you call anything wrong, accuracy is the key. I've only ever called one winner across the line wrong. It was a new market. Fortunately, it was before the days of in running because there were no financial commentations of that. Um, but I, I cocked up a Victoria Cup to as good as as good as that, muddling up more Stradish and um, Hawkeye than new um, for about 150 yards at a crucial stage of the race. Far too late to get out of it. The key is to give yourself lots of safeguards so you know um, You'll make lots of errors. We call 10,000 horses a year, you're going to make lots of errors. It's just you want to know what they are before everyone else does. You want to minimise the chances of that happening. And you want to make sure 15 times a year you've got to have a bullet and you just want to make sure it wings you rather than sort of cops you straight between the eyes. But, you know, that's the name of the game. It's live. Sometimes it goes well, quite often it doesn't.